this is Robin Llewellyn. She is a Launchpad member, and her topic is how do servant leadership and culture intersect. She is an expert on servant leadership. She's been a business consultant. She's been a, a talent development director. Uh, lots of impressive background and credentials. Uh, servant leadership is a leadership philosophy based on creating business opportunities in a just and caring way. Culture is the patterns of behavior in the workplace. If culture eats strategy for lunch, what does it do to leadership? Those are the questions that she will be answering today. So let's give it up, please. Robin Llewellyn. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, I, I, I do have 20 years of background in, um, I'm going to try to stay on this rug, that's right. Uh, so uh, I do have 20 years of background in human services, either HR or training, now called talent development, talent management. Um, I um, have spent about half of my career in for-profit and half, half in non-profit. I, I do have uh, two degrees, and I like to talk about them um, just briefly. I have my uh, bachelor's from um, University of Texas and my master's from Florida State University, and these are fine arts degrees. And I like to mention fine arts because I am proud of my fine arts degrees. <laughs> they taught me how to think in college, and I like to think. In fact, uh, thinking gets me into trouble sometimes, but it's usually thinking that gets me out of it, so it works pretty well for me. And I have been thinking about servant leadership for the last nine years. It is my leadership philosophy of choice. Full disclaimer, I am biased, okay? So I love servant leadership, excuse me, <clears throat> and, Recently, when in, I have been reading and studying things, culture keeps popping up in things that I am seeing and reading about. And I'm like going, well, what's going on with that? So I have been thinking about those two things, and I have been thinking about how they intersect and how they might work together. So today, what I'd like us to do, as I am biased, and I am talking about this leadership philosophy, and are you all leaders? Yes, thank you. We are all leaders, and as you are determining your leadership brand, I'm going to advocate for servant leadership and hope that you'll ask, okay. is servant leadership maybe right for me? Sorry. We're going to talk about this culture thing and why it is the hottest topic in the business world today and what's going on in the employment sector to make it so. And then, servant leader and culture, are they compatible? Do they work together, or are they at odds? And you told so, me leadership. I was, I was right about that. If I were to ask you, and I am, what are leadership qualities that you know are characteristics of great leaders? What would you immediately shout out? And if you would, just shout them out for me. Great leaders are? Listen. Love it. Motivate. Motivate. Excellent. They care. They support. They teach. They have great courage. They help get obstacles out of the way so that people can actually get stuff done. So they help get things out of the way so you can succeed. We got a room full of servant leaders, by the way. I can tell you right now from what you have shouted out, you are a room full of servant leaders in the making, if not already happening. So these are great qualities of leaders. And whether a leader is a transitional or a situational or a different kind of leader, what differentiates leaders and especially servant leadership? So we're going to talk about that for a, a brief minute. And in order to do that, we have to look at what servant leadership is. We have to talk about some basic principles. And then again, I'm going to advocate that it is a servant leadership philosophy worth exploring. So. What is, oh, let me go back, because you see a picture of a gentleman there. That gentleman's name is Robert Greenleaf, and he is credited with coming up, pinning uh, the essay that then um, the title of servant leadership came out of in this century. Now, servant leadership is an ancient and timeless philosophy, but in our work period now, Robert Greenleaf, excuse me, Toby, is the one who is um, credited with this title. So let me tell you a little bit about Robert Greenlee. 
Robert Greenlee, born in 1904, 1990, worked for 38 years at AT&T, right out of college. He discovered at AT&T that the leadership philosophy there was more of a coacher, coaching and mentoring situation, rather than the authoritative leadership style that was in most of the US institutions at the time. He wrote an essay in 1970 called Servant as Leader, thus the Servant Leader title. It was based heavily and inspired by concepts in Herman Hesse's novel, Journey to the East. That still doesn't tell us what servant leadership is, right? So servant leadership, other than a title, what does it really mean? So Greenleaf wrote this. And this is really where the concept of servant leadership is and where we differentiate servant leadership from other types of servant, uh, excuse me, leadership. So the first part of this speech, and I'm sorry, it's really kind of tiny, so I'm going to help you out with this. The servant leader, and this is the test for servant leadership, the servant leader is servant first. Becoming a servant leader begins with a natural feeling that one wants to serve to serve first, then the decision to lead comes out of that. So if I am out and about in the work world, I've got people that I'm working with, things are going well, my first inclination is to give my gifts, my time, my passion, all of those things to help that group succeed in its goals. After that inclination and that presence there in the group happens, I might discover that one of my great gifts of uh, serving this group is to lead this group. Does that make sense? Who is, by golly, I have to call her out, who is one of the greatest servant leadership people that you meet every week? Yes, absolutely, right? She just is the embodiment of wanting to help, getting in, and then taking on that leadership role after saying, I want to help, right? It's just her. So. The difference between the other type of leader, and the, by the way, leaders who are not servant leaders are not necessarily bad. It's not a good and a bad situation. There are great leaders who are not servant leaders. But the difference with a leader that is not a servant leader is that that impetus to lead comes from an I focus. So it's not bad, but I have great ideas. I can lead this company. I want to get more money and recognition, so I'm going to lead. I am going to do um, good things for the world, but it all starts with the I. I want the corner office, I want more money, I want recognition, I want to lead. So that's the difference. Another component that is in this sentence that really crystallizes the difference between servant leaders and other leaders is the last statement. This is the true test. Servant leaders are giving of themselves, and while they are, they are asking, do the people that I am serving become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, and more likely to become servants themselves? So servant leaders are not only serving and giving of themselves, they are helping people grow. So it's this awesome drop in the water, ripple out effect. So every time you engage and do the leadership qualities of servant leaders, you are helping people become more autonomous and more able to make those decisions which allow them to become servants and servant leaders also. Pretty, right? It's a very lovely concept, right? We are all helping other people grow. Still doesn't tell us about behaviors and qualities of servant leaders, so let's talk about that. There are absolutely phenomenal authors out there that write great books about servant leaders. I have chosen these four points from the Robert Greenleaf Center, which is a nonprofit uh, based on Greenleaf's essay and teachings. And if you uh, Google our search engine of your choice, um, Servant Leadership Greenleaf. You'll come to his uh, uh, website. It's a great resource for articles, podcasts, and more information on servant leadership uh, than you can digest in a short amount of time, and I encourage you to go there. It's a lovely, lovely resource. 
These four qualities come from the Greenleaf Center and their philosophy. So servant leaders listen. Who said listen? I know I heard that. Listen more, listen more than they talk. This should be on the to-do list of every human being on the planet. We should all learn to listen more than we talk. And listening happens with your heart, your mind, your hands, your ears, your nose, your mouth, every part of you see what is done and what's not done. You listen with every fiber of your being. And then after you've listened, you ask questions. And specifically, you ask people what they need. What do you need? How can I help? What resources do you need so that you can succeed? What barriers do I need to remove so that they are out of the way? And this is the miracle. This is the miracle. This is the shampoo instructions that you read. This is the rinse and repeat part. Because once you ask a question, you have to be silent and listen. And listen again. And then ask more questions. And ask great right questions. The great questions are the questions you do not know the answer to. So you can't lead people where you want them to go. You have to actually listen to what they're saying to determine where they want to go. And then you rinse and repeat, and you rinse and repeat, until finally you have this game plan in your head because you have gathered enough information to have the action plan, which is point number three, you help people grow. So at that point in time, you know what you need to do to give them the resources they need to be successful. And again, as a leader, that's the objective, to help them grow, to help them get better. You ask yourself, what am I doing today that allows the people that I'm working with to do their very best work? And you ask it every day. How am I helping? How am I working with people to grow? So the first three things, man, that is very much in the mix, right? We are in the mire of humanity. We are just in there, hands-on, listening, talking, listening, listening more, asking great questions. Greenleaf says another component of great leadership is to make sure that while you're leading by example and in the mix, you take time to step back, look at your data, look at your facts, Look at everything that's going on around you, then look up and look out. It is incredibly important to practice foresight because you must always be looking into the future for what is actually visible. And Greenleaf actually says not only do you need to look at what's visible, but you need to use your intuition so that you are able to look around corners so that you know what might be coming. So practicing foresight is the other element that's critically important for servant leaders. So they're in the mix, but they take the time to step back, look up, look out, and see where we're going so we can be prepared for that and we're not blindsided and helping people grow or helping people move into the future. Lovely, isn't it? It's really pretty, right? Buy into it? A lot of people think it is so lovely, it's so sweet, it's all puppies and kittens, it's just all from the heart, Servant leadership kind of gets a bad name. It's sometimes said it's soft, it's sweet, it's all hugs. Oh, you made a mistake. Oh, come here, you need to a hug. Okay, do your best, go back to work. It's okay, we all forgive you. No. The same things that happen in any workforce, any day of the week, happen under the leadership of a servant leader. People fail, people make bad judgments, people don't come to work, people have a skill that has to be developed and grown in order for them to be successful. Hard conversations, people get bad reviews, right? You get bad reviews, and this leader has to give that feedback to that person. And it's not soft. It's holding people accountable. It's making the things happen. The difference between a servant leader and another leader who might not choose to come from the point of view of the servant leader is that the servant leader always comes from a platform of love and caring and helping people grow. So if you're giving someone a hand up after they have just fallen down and failed miserably, it is a hand that is extended with love, justice, and caring. Not judgment, but caring. 
and that's an immense difference for the person who is receiving that. The results are still the same. There are still consequences for the mistake or the failure, and some of the times those consequences are consequences that result in separation from the company. That's bad. Uh, a lovely book by a gentleman named um, James Autry, it's called the Servant Leader, uh, writes about separation actually being an act of violence against a person, regardless of the reason. Separation is hard and it's an act of violence. So if that is going to be extended, if that is the consequence of the economy or actions or a reorg, it should be extended with love dignity and respect. And that's the difference. So servant leaders lift people up even after they fail. They believe in people. They believe that they will succeed. They are not, you know, have you ever heard of the theory X and theory Y and motivational, okay, X people? They think people are lazy. They don't want to succeed. They really, you know, you have to beat them with a stick or offer a carrot or you're not going to be able to get anybody to do anything worth it. Anything. Theory why people believe that people want to work, they want to be successful, they want to do the very best job that they can, and that's kind of where the servant leadership is, except now the servant leadership is not going, not only do I believe that you can do it, but I am going to give you the resources and the coaching and the mentoring so that you can do it. I believe in you, even after you have just failed. Again, consequences always exist but we're going to move to a positive place. So, some facts. Servant leadership does indeed work and make a positive influence on work environments. The 2015 Best Places to Work list just came out from Forbes. Five out of the top 10 companies practice formally servant leadership. 17 companies on the list formally practice servant leadership. It makes a difference in their engagement and their work and being an environment or a culture that people want to join. Servant leadership does it. This is the phenomenal statistic. 61 out of the 100, 61% of the companies on that list have individual employees, even if the company doesn't uh, put servant leadership as their formal leadership philosophy, 61 have employees that do practice servant leadership and they know that because it's documented either by a profile that they've created or someone else has created for them. That's why it's really important to talk about and think about your personal leadership style because when you go into your next place of employment, who are they going to look at? Who are people going to look at? When the new kid comes in, they're going to look at the new kid. And what's the new kid's leadership style? What's your brand? How are you going to move through the workforce and influence it? You need to know that. You need to think, how am I going to positively affect this environment that I'm getting into it? And 61% of individuals are making difference on those top places to work. So, making a few connections now. If servant leadership drives engagement or it makes it a better place to work, and it does, I think we have proof of that. We see it in our best places to work, our positive influence in different companies. How does servant leadership affect culture in driving engagement. Oh, okay, okay so, so this, this is a serious question. I do want some answers on this. So why is engagement now part of this equation? Why is engagement so important to people? So what does that do when you're really involved? Oh, say that again? So you exchange it for this better communication when we are involved. Excellent. What else? Okay, so job satisfaction. When you're engaged, you are better satisfied with your job. What happens when you are better satisfied with your job? You perform better. You perform better. Gallup, oh, go ahead. Um, it, 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 it
related to that, it encourages the best. It encourages the best from everyone. Oh, so your engagement actually affects the people around you and how they are engaged? Yes? So Gallup, the poll Gallup, does a um, survey and they actually measure engagement in companies across the United States. And sadly, their research says that about 70% of the U.S. market of employed people are either not terribly engaged or actively disengaged. 70%. Whoa. There are other studies out there that say that that's a little high, that it's probably more 50 or 60% that are satisfied and kind of happy in their job. But regardless, there's a chunk of people that are going to work every day and they are not driven they're not excited when Monday rolls around. They're not engaged with the people that are working next to them. And it's not good for business because people who are not engaged are not working at 100% of their capacity, right? You're not. And, as you said, it has a negative effect on the people around you too. It's hard to stay that focus when you're not surrounded by engaged people. So if servant leadership and wanting to help people grow and helping people become freer and more capable of making great decisions engages people and drives that metric, that's a good thing, right? right. Okay. And we are leaders and we all can be individual servant leaders wherever our small circle or our big circle of influence is and we can drive that engagement. Yes, that second little circle says culture. Now, how does culture fit into this equation? So, servant leadership drives engagement. How does culture drive engagement? Okay, so let, what is culture? Uh, oh, let's go to this one. So, what is culture? And I'll go back to the other one. So, what does that mean, the work environment? Give me more. Yes, give me more. Uh, 
Netflix is actually a company, uh, I wouldn't be able to work there, by the way. The culture of Netflix would not match me. They have a uh, manifest of uh, freedom and responsibility. Very few policies and procedures. They don't tell you how many vacation days you get a year. You can take as many vacation days as you want. You just have, you have the freedom to do whatever you want on those vacation days. You have to be responsible to the company, though, and make sure that your work is done. I end up not taking any days. I would not be the disciplined person that could figure out how to do that, you know? I just wouldn't. It wouldn't be a culture that I would thrive in. So policies and procedures, how they affect people. Oh, Google. What's Google's culture right now? What is it known for? Do no evil. What is it? Do no evil. Do no evil. It is. That is part of it. It is part of their... Uh, uh, their language, mm -hmm. very good. Creative. Not where I was going. Creative. Creative, they are very much. Playful. Playful, excellent. They are actually the culture that, and I was going for, I, that was not a curious question. I, I did have a place that I wanted y'all to go, so I'm going to just leave you there. Uh, forgive me. So uh, Google's culture is employee-centered. It is very employee-friendly. They want that to be the culture that they are known for. So if you actually work in California and, and at their site, you can go to the doctor on site, you can get your hair done on site, you can get your car changed. They pay for all education reimbursement. They uh, feed you whatever you want. It's just a culture of the employee is center. Sounds good, right? I wouldn't probably thrive in that culture either. I'd probably be in front of the refrigerator eight hours a day, and then the other eight hours I'd have to be at the ping pong table working off the calories that I ate at the refrigerator where they gave me all that stuff. And then I don't know when I would do the work. So it just depends on the culture and what the values and the norms are of the company to determine whether or not it is a match for you. I've gone through four of the six things from uh, Harvard Business School, so it was Vision, values, practices, people, the last two actually on that list are um, place. So actually where the company determines that they want to have their business, to your geographic part of the city, uh, the state, the region, the globe. So they make a decision on that. And the other part is actually what the place looks like. Is it a palatious uh, corporate headquarters with very large offices uh, lavishly laid out? Is it ultra modern? Is it cubes and bullpens? It's actually how they design the workspace. So that's the place. And the last one is the narrative. I kind of like narrative. Um, our business review says all businesses, all companies have a story that they tell. Apple, Steve Jobs. I don't know. I don't. Anybody got any examples of stories at a company that you've worked with that got folklore and myths and things that go into the history and the heritage of that company? And those are things that we assimilate into our workforce and our culture. Anybody have an example for me? Yeah. They are keepers of the narrative, of the history. And how do they assimilate that into the, the workforce? Do they talk about it? Is it? Well, yeah, it's part of, it's a part of the employee orientation. It's, you're expected to know it, of course, during the interview, right? One of our three key tenets espoused by our founder 100 years ago. You know, what, what projects have we worked on? Where do you think we're going? That sort of thing. And, and look, at our, look at our timeline. Tell us what we've been involved in and tell us where you think we're going, that sort of thing. That's awesome. So the past is going to project into the future, and they expect people to know that. They fully expect their past to direct them in the future. Wow. Thank you. That was a great story. Thank you very much. That was perfect. So, uh, so the, yes, there is a timeline and a history, and um, that are those are the 
six things that make up culture. They are patterns of behavior, they are beliefs and values, and they are how they are practiced on a regular basis, on a daily basis. So why, if that's culture, why is that now such a giant deal? If I really literally, I was going to show you all this one. Uh, so in Deloitte's Global Human Capital Trends Report, the top two things that uh, leadership and employees think that they should be working on currently, one is leadership. That's good, because we need leaders to take us into the future. And the other is culture and engagement. 90% of the executives and uh, staff asked that leadership was a number one concern, and then 86% of them said culture and engagement was the second most important thing that we should be thinking about. So culture, six things, kind of cool to think about and to listen to, but why is it critical today, now, and why is it actually really important to you now? Anybody know? What? <laughs> yes, we have, yes, and we do love work, don't we? I love work. Yes. So, yes, but why, what's happening right now in the world that's different than before? Uh, a lot of systems uh, are broken, and they uh, and something new needs to happen. How do you know a lot of systems are broken? Uh, oh, who said it? Social media. I'm sorry, you can pick any of those companies that I have logos up there for. Just put them in a couple of strokes on the computer, attach the word culture to it, and you have so much information about that company instantly available to you. Uh, I, I did HEB. In a split second, I can have a thousand reviews of people and individual employees that are telling me what they think about the company, what they think about their leadership, what should be improved, and how they really felt about their job. A thousand people I could look at. That's not, uh, uh, that's Glassdoor. You use Glassdoor? Yeah, good. it's awesome. That's not to mention LinkedIn, that's not to mention Facebook, that's not to mention Indeed. Anybody that is applying for jobs, wanting to get in, Past and previous employees are giving us this absolutely transparent window that we can get in and see what the culture is. So if we can all look in and see what the culture is, companies better be paying attention to what their culture is, right? And the other factor that I think is important to us looking for work is we can know what they want the culture to be, see what people are saying the culture is, know what we want our culture to be, we want to know what kind of company we want to join, we can decide this is a match. Now I'm going to go into the interview and I'm going to let them know that this is a match. Because I know what they're looking for, I know what they're thinking about, and I'm going to present myself in a way that is a positive, and it's going to be a very strong interview position. The other thing that's happening in the world today is unemployment rates are going down. The tide is tipping toward the power of the employee. Uh, as opposed to the employer, we've got more information. There's um, uh, Fewer of us out there looking at this point in time, so that is a good thing. New jobs are being created. Oh, one phenomenon that's happening too, which is kind of interesting. The workforce is actually getting older and younger simultaneously. So we have this incredible diverse need. And people now, companies are now going, how do we deal with this? How do we take care of this very diverse workforce that is coming on? And they're having to look at making sure that the needs of the employee is met. Cool, right? Good place to be. We're in a great place right now. Good things are going to happen for us. So, the thing that we need to remember is you have a wealth of information out there. Use it. 
use it and make good, wise decisions on what company you want to join. Oh, I do have, from an HR perspective, a fear. It's just a tiny one. But I, I think this is such a popular thing that it's being discussed with people, and the hiring managers are really thinking about it, but I'm not sure we know a whole lot about it now. So my fear is that hiring managers might, uh, even though we'll have a very diverse workforce, we still might be using this cookie cutter to get the same characteristics of people, and we'll lose some of our diversity, which is a really powerful thing in a workforce. So that's my fear. So if you're a hiring manager coming up, you want to make sure you keep that diversity and that power there. But I do think companies do and should look at uh, core values and beliefs that are good matches for employees coming in. For instance, I will give you, this is one of my favorite uh, core values of a company. Uh, it's James Wren and Company. And their first core value is this. Three coats means three coats. They're a painting company. <laughs> Why do I love it? I love it because it embodies what they're really going after, right? What is it? My word is my bond. I'm not going to, if I tell you I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. Now, if I applied for this company, I would tell them a story, and I would not work there. I would tell them that there is no wall in the universe that deserves three coats of paint, and that in my house we only do two, and two means one, and then I go back and touch up where I miss, and that's the second coat. They would not hire me, right? I am not a good match for James Britton. I'm not a good match for Nordstrom's. Customer focus, right? They give tire money back for tires they don't sell. Well, I do believe that the customer is right if the customer is me. But everybody else, I'm not sure I can make that statement. So they would not hire me. I'm not a good match for them. But if I interviewed at Southwest Airlines and they like fun, I could be fun. I can be funny. And I can even be funny and fun under stress. I'm a good match for that. So I want to make sure when I go in, the culture of the company is truly a match for me. And that I'm going to be successful. And I do think companies should make that match. And you should also look at core values and make sure that that company is a match for you, that you're going to be successful in the long term. So use the dynamics of the market. It is so out there, social media so available to you, and demonstrate your talent, strengths, uh, skills, ability, and then make sure that people recognize they're hiring for culture, so address it. Address it. I am a cultural match, and this is why I know I am, and give them those reasons. Ask great questions uh, when you're in that interview if they haven't told you the answers uh, about cultural uh, things that are going on in that company so you know what it is. So, culture drives engagement. Why? How? Yes. If, if, if culture is driving engagement, then the culture is the fuel. And if the fuel is bad or toxic, then you're not going to get a whole lot of engagement because people don't want to be poisoned even when they have to be in the poisonous market. Okay, so you brought up a great point. There probably are a few companies out there that have a toxic culture, right? And you want to stay away from those. Most companies don't. Most companies want to be doing the best that they can, just like most people want to be successful. So toxic anything you stay away from. And, and, then, and then the reverse of that is a, a positive, healthy culture that values the that are creating will actually create a lot more engagement so that more is possible. The best of everything is possible. In an environment, in a culture that is positive and growing. Welcoming. Yes. Excellent. Thank you so much. Positive environments beget positive people, positive workforce. One of the ways that positive cultures are created and supported is by hand-in-hand -hand work with the leadership program. And I believe that servant leadership actually is 
an excellent service, uh, excuse me, a leadership program that will drive both the positive culture and the leadership, so it's hand in hand. So going back to my original question as I finish up here, uh, so um, servant leadership drives engagement, great quality uh, leadership program that develops people, helps them grow, works with them to become better employees. That's a positive influence on the culture. Culture, very powerful, very interesting. Something that we do not change quickly because there's a whole history and timeline that we go to. There's place, there's people, there's practices, there's what the company wants to be. So it's kind of ingrained. So servant leadership and whatever culture the company has, what do you think? Can it go hand in hand? Can it work together? Yeah, it can. Because servant leadership transcends some of those things, but it is always about people and the work that they do. Culture is also about people and the work that they do. It's how they do it. So I think, truly, servant leadership would not be eaten for lunch by uh, culture. In fact, I think culture and servant leadership would join hands and go to lunch together, and it would be a good thing. I'm advocating that you might want to set more on servant leadership, and if you Google culture, you're just going to be fascinated what's out there uh, in the world to discover about it and how it can actually be used to help you in your job search.